It's been interesting. It's a whirlwind. It's been uh, exhausting, but I think really fulfilling. 1000 Cut Journey is a virtual reality experience. We immerse you in experiences of racism from the perspective of a black male who's having these experiences at different points in his life. People's reactions have been mixed. I mean, I think people generally have been touched, have expressed learning something new and different about experiences of racism that they didn't know before. I think it's a very active and innovative and growing space. People are becoming more experimental with ways to use this medium, pushing public discourse around timely social issues. It certainly seem to be a theme for pieces this year. We've had actors and directors come by. It's been moving for prominent people who work in the industry to react so positively to some of the work that we're doing, given that we're not filmmakers, uh, but trying to tackle this complicated social issue. Hi, and welcome back to the second episode of Just Societies Live, which is a collaboration between the School of Social Work and the Columbia Just Societies Initiative, which I'll say something about in a, in a little while. I'm Michael Friedman. Uh, I teach health policy and mental health policy here at the School of Social Work. And we have two terrific guests uh, with us today, very accomplished people. Uh, Courtney Cogburn, who is here on my right, and she's an assistant professor at the School of Social Work, and she's done some remarkably interesting work uh, with virtual reality, which we're going to talk about. And Lance Weiler, who is, a f I'll read this, a founding member and director of the Columbia University School of the Arts Digital Storytelling Lab. And you've been nominated for an Emmy and had other remarkable achievements. Both of you have been in the Tribeca Film Festival. Really remarkable for a social worker. That's <laughs> that's very unusual. It's weird. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this is this is a probably a unique meeting. You've never met each other before. No, right? we've never uh, met. Yeah. And I, there probably hasn't been very much contact between the School of Social Work and the School of the Arts. And part of what the uh, Just Societies Initiative about, is about is to bring together diverse parts of the school mm -hmm. uh, in the hope that each is doing something related to social justice and for people to meet and talk about that. And so here we are. Yeah. Here we are Happy today. To uh, and, and I thought, you know, I'm very interested. I understand why the School of Social Work is involved. Because we're social workers, we have uh, an ethical duty to pursue social justice. What's the School of the Arts doing in this? Well, um, I'm an associate professor at the School of the Arts right. across uh, film and theater, and uh, we're interested both in that program and also with the digital storytelling lab in exploring new forms and functions of storytelling. So a form might be something like artificial intelligence, virtual mm -hmm. reality, augmented reality, the Internet of Things, and a function might be healing or uh, policy or learning or entertainment. And so we're, we're, we're kind of always kind of pushing at the edges of what's possible with a story. Uh, we have done some work with Dr. Desmond Patton um, right. here at the School of Social Work. And we've also collaborated with uh, the Urban Design Program. Uh, and we've collaborated with the Journalism School. Yeah. Um, and so we're very interested in kind of bridging, I guess you could say, taking taking the elements of what we know to be storytelling, because the School of the Arts is very right. focused on storytelling, and then the work that I'm doing within the School of the Arts is very much about creating a bridge to the 21st century. How do we use immersive technologies or emergent technologies mm. in ways that are human-centric, in ways that can uh, be inclusive, in mm. ways that can allow for hopefully some type of a shift in perspective. Um, and so a lot of the work is kind of focused in that so, area. So uh, I want to come back and talk about some of the specific work that you've done. But Courtney, you've done some fascinating work with virtual reality and, and trying to carry across the message of Black Lives Matter. And I just wonder if you can talk about that a bit. Yeah, you know, I think it's been interesting for me. Um, when I started this project, I'd never used virtual reality, but I was imagining that the ability to walk in someone else's shoes, be them digital shoes, right. um, might be powerful. And so wanted to explore some of those options. And I think uh, in the experience that we've created, you become a black male as a child, an adolescent, and as an adult experiencing racism in different forms at different points in your life. Um, and I think through developing this work, the power of story has become very clear to me, the power of media, the power of technology, 
Um, and I've come to understand the significance of narrative in social change in a way that I didn't understand before taking this project on. Um, so in your remarkable t TED talk uh, that, you, that you did a while back, one of the things that you talked about was how difficult it is to get people to act so that there's a huge difference between people voicing certain kinds of values and people acting on those values and I know that this was an exercise to try to help them do that. Yeah, I mean I think there's a gap oftentimes between beliefs that people espouse and their behaviors right. and them actually showing up and engaging the issues that they say are important to them. And I found that to be true around issues of racism and, and racial inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and in this experience, we target white liberals explicitly as um, an important group to engage mm -hmm. around these issues. So this is a group that espouses belief of ra beliefs of racial justice and racial equality, but in my experience, um, don't fully understand the realities of racial inequality. It's, it's, it's a little bit intellectual in terms of engagement and not so emotional. And so the hope was that a visceral experience in virtual reality may help to connect in a deeper, more personal way um, with that particular audience to help Did them shift work? behavior. Did it work? We'll see. Know? We've just finished a, a round of studies uh -huh. um, trying to examine whether we're having the types, seeing the types of effects that we'd like to observe. Um, yeah. So we haven't analyzed the data yet, but we'll see. Well, my what? son went through it at, oh, at, uh, yeah, at Tribeca, and it definitely had a profound effect on him. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he had all kinds of questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. I mean. He might have been, he was 11, so I, I don't know what the age was, but I let him go through it and we had a, a conversation That's about wonderful. it afterwards. Yeah. And he had, he was really fascinated by it, um, as he was a lot of the different types of immersive work, which I think is interesting because I think there's, there's almost kind of a, when I look at my son, there, there's such a digital native thing there yeah. and understanding right. how to That's actually right. interact with these, uh, these devices or these screens. Yeah. and. And then also the, the challenges that that presents in terms of media literacy and, and digital literacy. Um, but it was really interesting to see his response. Yeah, I, I think that's part of what's been so, what I think is important about the work is the, the interaction that happens after you come out of the headset. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I feel like going through this emotional experience may open people up to a different kind of conversation. Um, um, so that's wonderful to hear yeah. that you're able to have such a meaningful conversation. Has, has he gotten engaged in social action in a different way? Uh, well, so we do a lot. How old is your son? He's 11. He's so, 11. Okay, so well, we, that's, that's we do a, we We do quite a bit of work together, um, and he's often involved in the projects that I'm working on. Uh -huh. You know, he's come and he's actually spoken and, and kind of lectured to my class, my graduates, uh -huh. uh, oh, about awesome. this idea of those formerly known as the audience who are now storytellers, and, and he'll bring them up and he'll play like Minecraft or Roblox and he'll create, uh, he'll modify a game and invite them in and they'll drive wait, a car wait, wait. together and and then he'll show them how, uh, he'll tell stories with them. So like he'll come into my class, he'll lecture, he'll put together a PowerPoint. He, he know, comes into your class. Into my class. And he lectures. And he lectures and he talks about how he creates, how he's a storyteller uh -huh. and how he's using these digital tools to tell stories and share stories with his friends and then he'll create an environment that my students then go up and sit down with him uh -huh. and they're in the game with him. That's and awesome. then he'll guide them through the game and they'll talk uh, you know, uh, to each other within it. Yeah. But uh, it's this, I think it's that digital literacy that I was right. talking about that's really powerful and interesting. I think, well, I think that's fascinating. I mean, you know, as you can tell, I'm a somewhat older person yeah. and uh, I'm completely inarticulate when it comes to games and things like that. I've never played any games. Well, maybe years ago I played sure. one, but uh, but I watch my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So my grandchildren under the age of one already had iPads and already knew how to use them. Yeah. And, and their consciousness is defined by this in some way that's quite different from mine, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, it's so fascinating like, to hear to hear you to hear about your son connecting with other people this way and having consciousness around how his story can be shared by other people and how stories can be created together. Whether you're doing it deliberately or mm -hmm. not, you're still sharing the same story. I think is quite powerful. It's it's a you know representation of human connection and whether mm -hmm. we're using technology to represent and visualize that we are all tied together. We're in the same story. Um, and I think the more in which we can be conscious about that and, and maybe create and tell those stories together. 
So, so people actually get into the same story. They, they're outside a, and as you can see, I'm fumbling with this whole concept. Sure, sure. sure. <laughs> it's, it's tough for me to get. But they're physically outside, but somehow they get into this game or into this film or into this experience, and they experience themselves as in it. Yeah, it's, it has a level of embodiment to it, which yeah. is really kind of fascinating. Because yeah. what I'm talking about is, uh, they're known as a kind of a sandbox or emergent games, which means that you can build and you can create the world that you want to see, uh -huh. which is really kind of an interesting slant on what you were talking about in terms of shifting perspective by going into a virtual reality uh, element. These are an opportunity to create almost like shared narratives yeah. or collective narratives in an interesting way which I think uh, is a challenge to what we see in terms of like within storytelling, a lot of uh, principal narratives are driven by, you know, the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. But now we're seeing like this rise of a collective journey or a shared journey, which is really kind of interesting. That's very interesting. You know, yeah. so it's kind of challenging the notion of how these stories are created. There's, there's four kind of design principles that we use at the lab that I think are very appropriate mm -hmm. to these types of experiences. One is this idea of a trace. People really respond when they can see some part of themselves within an experience. The other is this notion of granting agency. Uh, what is it like to have agency versus one versus agency as many? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you move from one environment into another? And what does that mean when you're socially with a group of people? Uh, the third is kind of this idea of a thematic frame. And a lot of the work that we use, we're kind of looking at, like currently, we, we're doing a piece around uh, Frankenstein, uh, a celebration of Mary Shelley's work, looking at isolation and connection, but really looking at inclusivity in, in and around AI and bias within algorithms, mm -hmm. and using the narrative thematic of Frankenstein to create an, uh, almost like a metaphor for the monster is, is, is like what AI is, yeah. right? And then the last is this idea of serendipity management, this notion that a lot of times digital experiences are over-designed. They're worried that somebody's going to break them. But it's when you leave blank space within them and you allow people to connect in unexpected ways, like what you were saying, like the conversation after the experience. But what's that like to leave room for that in the experiences in the experience that we design? Yeah. So, so this suggests to me, as a social worker who had much of his career spent in social advocacy that, that there are new tools out there that are a mystery to me, not to you, but, but I wonder to what extent the field of social work is I mean, I, I think caught up with this. It's important. I, it was a mystery to me before yeah. I started. I'd never used the technology before, but I felt like I had an important perspective that could be represented in, in the technology. And so Part of my um, new mission is to create more opportunities for social workers to take their deep, rich expertise and experience and start to imagine new ways to engage, to advocate, to use these technologies to do their work. Um, and I also think it's important for the ethics and principles and practices of social work to be at the table when we're developing new technologies. Um, when we're thinking about tech for social good, you need the people who do the for good part at the table. Um, and so I think there's multiple ways in which social work makes sense in um, story and makes sense in art and makes sense in how we use and apply technology. Well, I'm also wondering, should we be teaching social advocacy differently than the way we're teaching it? I don't, or maybe I don't, expand I don't it. want to call on you to be critical of the school. Uh, you know, but, uh, no, but I think expand it. The world yeah. is changing. Our tools are changing. Um, the, the context in which we are engaging is, is rapidly shifting, and we have to keep up. I mean, I th again, as a person who's done social advocacy for 40 years or so, uh, this is really fascinating mm -hmm. to me uh, because we have certain ways in which we go about social and political advocacy, and we haven't used, people I know haven't used these kinds of technologies uh, uh, to do that. But I, I think there's, there's an important point here. I think there are new skills that social, work, social workers can learn. I also think that social workers already have a rich expertise that needs to be leveraged, right? right? So yes, we need to expand their education, but we also need to make the types of connections across disciplines where you solve these really complicated 
problem. So it's not necessarily that social workers need to be different. It's that we need to be engaged with other disciplines who have an expertise. And once you connect... So that suggests that uh, trying to deepen this partnership, uh, I don't know if this is the first meeting between the School of Social Work and the School of the Arts. Well, no, he's but, done work with Desmond Patton. Oh, um, Desmond, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So I forgot about it's that. Al it's yeah. already there, yeah. Yeah, oh, and that was an amazing experience because we worked with Safe Lab. Yeah. And uh, we looked at kind of creating a de-escalation room together, and we brought it into my immersive production class, and uh -huh. the students took some of the, the findings from what uh, Desmond and his colleagues were doing and, and thought, well, what if we could co-design a space that allowed high school students to de-escalate violence? What would that look like through performative arts? Mm -hmm. What would that look like through emergent technologies? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that's really exciting because I think the transdisciplinary side is at the core of what we're doing yeah. with the lab right. in particular. And I think it's imperative in terms of emergent technology because I think for the longest time technology has been shaped by engineers and has been shaped by a Silicon Valley capitalistic narrative mm -hmm. and the opportunity to bring humanity to the table so you know humanity can shape technology before it shapes us so to your point earlier that ability to bring different voices not only in the use of the technologies but actually in the design of those technologies mm -hmm. and the implementation of those technologies and to shift it away from such an, a user user need, right, because that's how it is in Silicon Valley, to a human need. And then you can start to see that, okay, there's a whole new generation that's coming up where yeah. this is digitally native. How can we get ahead and use these technologies to help model things, to help people uh, step into somebody else's shoes, to, to help them be able to look at, you know, not only different perspectives, but to be able to capture data in and around that so we can uh, be more mindful in terms of how we're using it. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, you had suggested there are certain ethical issues that come up in using this, these new technologies. I wonder if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of questions have, have come up for us in using the virtual mm -hmm. reality, right? We're, we're having people experience racism. Um, for some people, that's, for many people, that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're not quite sure what virtual reality does to people. Um, and so we're sort of experimenting in some uh -huh. ways. And so there were questions raised for us about how far do we push in terms of what we do. So for instance, there's a police scene where you get down on your knees and put your hands up uh -huh. and the police are very aggressive. We had to think through how far do we push that experience, where's the line for us. Um, I have a colleague who said that after she's left the experience, several weeks later, had a police officer just walking her general direction and she felt herself get scared. She felt her heart rate increase right. and she attributed that to going through the VR. We have to think about whether we want to do that or not. Um, Is there an issue about informed consent since you're, you're doing it's research on this? It's challenging. It's challenging because I think most people don't know how realistic it can be. Yeah. Um, it's a hypothetical until you've actually done VR. So It never occurred to me until yeah. just now. I mean, I'm thought, so you, you go to the Tribeca Film Festival and there's a however you set this up so people could go through this experience. It's like going to a movie, right? So you go to a movie and you watch a movie. But you're actually doing research. Well, we're not doing we're not collecting data at the Tribeca Film you're Festival. Okay. Uh, but when we're collecting in the lab, of course, we have to think very carefully about making sure people understand what they're stepping into so that they can wow, make an informed that's, decision. That's but it's difficult, difficult when they're not familiar with the technology. Yeah. The, the other thing that I think is really fascinating is there, we're in a very early phase of making use of this technology, so the grammar is being shaped. So there's a very literal translation of what it tends to be or how we can use the technology, which can be limiting. Right. The ability to kind of use story or metaphor within these experiences can be incredibly powerful and in allowing people to find meaning within them through a sense of self-discovery can be very valuable mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I have a project that will open uh, next week at Tribeca, which is I was collaborating with my father on up until his death from stage four cancer, mm -hmm. and we were collaborating on that piece together, and it's called Where There's Smoke. Um, and it's kind of looking at a lack of empathy within healthcare, mm -hmm. and it's looking at the cycle of life and end of life. And people come into this experience, and there's a moment where they start by sharing stories with each other around an object that they would choose to save from a fire. Mm -hmm. And then they go through an oh, exercise that's, an that's like a, a five times why, like why yeah. are you emotionally connected to this and then it digs deeper and then mm -hmm. all that's a primer for when they explore a space that's actually all been destroyed by fire and then they interact with these enchanted objects 
that um, unlock narrative possibilities. So they place them on a table and mix and match them and the room responds to what's happening. And then it kind of catches them on the other side yeah. where they share their own stories. But within it, it's kind of about this idea of memories through objects and this notion of the objects stay, the body fades, what's left behind is subjective in terms of the memories that that live on. And what's interesting about that is it uses comm technology. There's no actual screens. Like devices fight, they're, they're very needy. Mm -hmm. It's like me, 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 me. It's all notifications. Or even with VR or augmented it's reality, very it's, yeah. it's very present. Um, there's a whole other side to the technology with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things, where everyday objects or things around us. Um, can be used to tell stories. Mm -hmm. so I, would, I would love to learn more about that. Uh, uh, maybe because yeah, I'm getting to that age where <laughs> I have to look forward to uh, what I'll do at the yeah. Yeah. towards the end of life. Uh, the selection of objects is actually very interesting, I think. Uh, but we have a question, so let's let's turn to that. Is it possible for a new MSW student? to take classes in the digital storytelling lab and integrate these cross disciplines? Perhaps as a minor, are there classes online? Uh, well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, we are running programs all the time. So uh, we have three electives that we have students from different parts of the university that can drop into. One is Digital Storytelling 1, which is about the history of uh, kind of interactivity. Digital Story 2, uh, Digital Storytelling 2, which I teach, which is about um, building story worlds, the art, craft, and business of storytelling in the 21st century. And then we have Digital Storytelling 3, which is uh, an immersive production class where the, the class comes together, all different disciplines, and they create something that we put into the world at the end of the semester. Yeah. So somebody graduating from uh, the School of Social Work now could... Mm -hmm. How would they get in touch? I just go online, or they would. Well, they can find out more information. We're in the process of moving the site over to the School of the Arts, but for right now, you can go to digitalstorytellinglab.com. That's digitalstorytellinglab.com. We Good. hold monthly meetups. Uh, we're always running uh, projects and, and and programs that people can. Plug right. In. So there's nothing formal at this point, but there's a, an opportunity to connect. I mean, nothing formal between the two schools. Is no, no, right. but... But yeah. what I should mention is that yeah. um, Desmond and I just got a, um, a tech, social work and tech minor just approved for oh, really? our MSW students. Wow. And so we have uh, required courses and then the electives that will identify that we think align. And the digital storytelling telling lab courses certainly qualify for the types of things that fit with the minor. So, so our students will formally have an option yeah. uh -huh. to have okay. an emerging tech media and society minor um, as well as taking advantage of the courses. Well, that's a remarkable new development. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Uh, moving into the modern age here. 21st Terrific. century social worker. I'm curious how students can encourage Columbia School of Social Work to integrate emerging technology into our learning experience in order to understand, interact with the client well, uh, clientele in an improved and modern way. So I think that the tech minor is, is one step in right. that direction. Um, and then Desmond Patton and I are also starting a lab and hopefully will eventually turn into a center that's thinking about the intersections of emerging tech and social justice that will be housed here at the School of Social Work. So I think the school is very open to moving in this direction and making some concrete steps to support that. So I s suspect that there's a clinical undertone to this question. Okay. That, that the person is wondering whether in teaching clinical social work uh, there's some way to use some of these modern technologies uh, that probably are not yet being included. I, I don't know the, yeah, so the clinical the, curriculum. So Carmela I'm not sure. Alcantara, who's um, an yeah. associate professor here in the school, um, is using technology to engage um, around clinical practice. Um, there are people around the country who are thinking about virtual reality to treat PTSD symptoms, to work with veterans. Oh, so yes, that work is happening. And so the degree to which it gets integrated right. um, at the School of Social Work here is, is yet to be seen, but um, it's very much on the, the horizon. So in the deep recesses of my memory, uh, there's something about a form of uh, a therapy, which is the use of storytelling. And that it's used, as I recall, particularly with older people, uh, to engage them in telling stories about their life and so forth. So I, I just wonder whether there's a connection there as well. Uh, again, I'm not 
particularly familiar with how that's done, but it sounds you've got all this storytelling uh, and, and, and ways to do it. It might be really interesting to uh, connect what you are doing with the, the, the psychotherapists who are doing narrative yeah, well, therapy. Well, um, the, the Where There's Smoke project, I've been in conversation with the Narrative Medicine Program, and we've collaborated with uh -huh. them in the past. And uh, I think that that ability to use stories or allow people to step into environments that um, uh, allow them to safely uh, be able to uh, experience something or to make sense of a past experience, yeah. it, there's a lot of potential there. I mean, it's all things that I'm learning. I, I think there's intuitive things from being a storyteller and a lot of the work that I do is very much uh, it's very participatory, so it's not, it's not like the narrative is written in stone. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's fighting against the traditional structure of a, th a three-act structure. Mm -hmm. In fact, that project at Tribeca is different every time somebody goes the story through changes, it. Changes, yeah. It changes, and the context of what you're seeing is based upon your interactions. Well, that's really so it's a generative documentary. So in that sense, it's kind of like it's a. A lot of these things are difficult to classify and they're hard to understand when you haven't seen them before. Yeah. You always look for something that's familiar, right? So in this piece, you're interacting with a documentary that's generative, it's not linear. You're uh, stepping into an immersive theater experience that has no performers and you're interacting with what's known as a format like an escape room that has no puzzles or has no escape. So it's like this mm -hmm. thing where you're trying to find these things as ways to define it but it's actually creating new forms, yeah. which is really kind of fascinating. Yeah, yeah it really is. I've just have, have you that used the, it? Uh, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to add that I um, just learned that the new, thinking about these important intersections, like the way a clinician might use story and way medicine might use narrative, and um, there's uh, the New York uh, Department of Health has just hired an artist to imagine how she or they would solve the problem of maternal health disparities. Um, and it's very interesting to bring someone yeah. into a space that they're not connected from the health perspective, but the way they'll see and imagine a solution will be completely different. Um, so to me, again, it's, it's representative of these important intersections and what may happen when a clinician works with someone who's deeply tied to story and narrative and what they might make yeah. together. One of my colleagues here at Columbia once said that there are people who solve the problems of their discipline and people who solve the problems of the world. And the people in that latter category have to rely on perspectives and disciplines that are well out beyond their their training and their reach. But when they come Can together, you say that again? I like that. There are, there people, are people who, who go ahead. solve the problems of their discipline and people who solve problems of the world. And people who are in that latter category are forced to draw on expertise and experience and perspectives that are very different than their own to tackle those very difficult problems. I like that distinction, solving yeah, problems I thought it was, of the it's discipline. Not, it's not mine, it's, it's somebody. Well, whoever, yeah. it's, whoever it was. Thank you for yeah, mentioning yeah, it. Very, I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal it and use, yes, <laughs> use it yeah. in the future. Yeah. I was going to ask a quick question. I'm sure we have another question here now. But uh, what about oral history? Have, have you gotten connected with uh, uh, some using of the folks, some of your techniques for oral history at all? Well, there's um, there's definitely techniques from oral history that are really interesting, like object biographies and things uh -huh. along those lines. Um, and some of the folks from oral history will come and participate in some of the events that we do. Uh, but you know, would love to find a way uh, to to intersect with them more and other parts of the university as a whole, because mm -hmm. I, I I really agree that. It's these shifts in perspective that open up possibilities. Yeah. We we have um, we do a thing. Uh, Frank Rose, who's a fellow of the lab, and myself uh, are artistic directors around a, uh, uh, this awards that we do every year. That's called Digital Dozen Breakthroughs in Storytelling, and you can find it at digitaldozen.io. It's amazing examples of storytelling. Oh, okay. um, one of the give the address again. Uh, digitaldozen.io. And um, you can find for the lab, we've done it for four years, but you'll find such an eclectic mix of projects. Some that are, uh, there was one that was um, doing it around uh, dementia. It was called Healing Spaces, and it was working with patients who suffer from dementia. And it was using mm -hmm. uh, kind of emergent technology as a way to uh, take them and transport them to a different mm -hmm. place. Uh, there uh, have been things that are operas in cars, and there's been uh, projects that are looking at using augmented reality as a tool to educate youth 
uh, by starting in an augmented reality app and then building the full space and allowing the youth to actually open the door and they go into the actual physical wow. space. Yeah. So like uh, interesting uses and applications of it that you can see at work from all over the world. Well, we've got another question here, sure. much as I'd like to uh, <laughs> follow up on this. Wonderful work and information. Dr. Cochran, in, in the lab and after a virtual reality experience of being a black man, what are some of the findings of your research? So we don't know the findings of the research yet. We've just finished or wrapping up um, the, the empirical side of the work, So, but I can speak anecdotally to what we, you know, we're seeing in people. We've run hundreds of people through the experience thus far. Um, what my sense is, is that people are being deeply affected in a way that's different than other ways that they've engaged. And so people will come out and say things like, you know, I've gone to the protest, I've signed the petitions, I, I read and think about this all the time. This feels different. I didn't understand it in this way. Um, people who send emails later after they've gone through the experience and say, I'm engaging with media differently around these sorts of issues like police violence. Uh -huh. Differently, it feels more emotional. It's not as intellectual having gone through the experience. Um, and it's also clear that whites and people who are not white are reacting in very different ways. You're tapping into different memories. Um, if you put a black person in a headset and they become a black person, that's different than putting a white person in a headset and having them become a what, black person. What about person. putting a uh, Latino person in a headset or a uh, so I think there's a shared, a, an I think, Asian person? I think in what's a more what's more important is um, so one the blackness matters because you're representing a black body. Yes, but aside right. from that, I think what's important are people who have deep personal experiences with racism, regardless of their race. And if you're pulling on actual memories, people you care about, your own experiences, you're reacting to this virtual experience differently than someone who's only thought about it or experienced it as a hypothetical, um, which tends to be right. uh, whites, and people who are not white tend to have these more explicit experiences around race. So, so then you would expect that uh, somebody who's, uh, pick your, your Asian country, mm -hmm. uh, someone who's Asian who has been through, at least historically, uh, many of the things that happened during the Second World War, as well as uh, uh, discrimination and bias here in the United States, that if you gave them the experience of, uh, uh, of, of being a black man through virtual reality, mm -hmm. they would react differently to it than somebody who is, uh, got off, family got off the Mayflower. I think so. I think it's complicated. I don't yeah. want to oversimplify yeah. that. Um, there's also this shared notion of anti-blackness, for instance, that also exists globally. Um, yeah. So that, that's introduced regardless of who you are. Uh -huh. um, but yes, I think it is a different experience when you've personally that's been oppressed around race right. or ethnicity than yeah. someone who has not. Okay. So that's interesting. You both mentioned uh, that art of various kinds can increase empathy in the viewer. But is empathy enough to drive social change? What are the limitations? Oh, well, well, jump I, in, jump in. Uh, well, I think I, I can only speak from the the work that we're kind of doing. That the empathy, like a lot of the the work that we're doing a, around the lab, is really kind of not just about designing for someone; it's designing with. So being able to uh, would be brought to this so that people could go from a change in empathy or a change in how they feel about things to actually changing the way in which they behave. Well, it's interesting if you look at um, design thinking, for instance, and, and the, 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 the progression of design thinking, it'll start with an empathy phase. You'll use the empathy as a way to kind of define what you're going to do and you'll shape kind of a design question, how might we? Right, which is a very inviting to whoever's participating. And then from there, that'll start to lead to this idea of brainstorming or ideation in and around what you're trying to do. And then from there, you'll start to create little prototypes, little things that you can just test. And then you'll test them, and then you'll kind of repeat that cycle again. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and some of the things that we do at the lab is we bring in those other, uh, the, the, the people that we're either working with or, or collectively, wh whatever that is, um, and we'll bring them in through each of those steps, um, and then we modify that a little bit in our own use. But, but I think that that's interesting as frameworks. Now, that classically was a framework that has, 
was used for the development of products initially, mm -hmm. but then has also been used more and more by NGOs, has yeah. been used more and more as a way to improve services, has been used as a way to kind of open up thinking around health care and other, other areas. So let me change context a, a little bit. Uh, my background is in the world of mental health, and uh, many years ago I did work on stigma related to, uh, to mental illness, and at that time conclusion that we reached was that it was one thing to change belief and quite another thing to change action. And that in fact you could change action without changing belief and you could change belief without changing action. The kind of examples that we were talking about are things like uh, hiring people with mental illness. So you could build up uh, some sense of sympathy but people didn't necessarily change their hiring practices or you could in fact find ways to change hiring practices and that would have some ripple effect as well. So I'm wandering here but, but I'm just wondering you know what we used to say was the best way to address stigma was to find ways to bring mentally ill people and non mentally ill people together to do something together and that when they had the experience of doing something together then sort of the bigotry about mental illness would dissipate um, and fear in both directions as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, well, people are afraid of mentally ill people but mentally ill people are pretty afraid of the world that they're in as well. So I'm just wondering whether some of these techniques could be used to address uh, that kind of thing. Huh? Well, I, if I could from a different perspective, sure. um, with the Frankenstein Project, we did these immersive dinners. Uh -huh. And so you would sit down with a group of strangers, and, and what we wanted to drive was an awareness around AI and, and to have people talk about it. But a lot of the narrative around artificial intelligence is very dystopian, right? And so how could we have a conversation where we could authentically get to a real conversation around it? Uh -huh. And so people sat down who didn't know each other, and the narrative conceit was that Frankenstein's monster was an AI that had been wandering the internet in search of what it meant to be human, but it was encountering a lot of polarization, toxicity, extreme hate, extreme love. So it was confused, so it had decided to assemble people in the real world so it could observe and learn from them. So on each plate of the, uh, at the dinner was a little earpiece that you would put into your ear, and the AI would talk to the people at the table, but might talk to you, or you, or you, or all of us at the same time, and might say something to me, hold on to this and say it in your own words when you feel it's the right time, lean over and whisper this to the person next to you, mm -hmm. and would basically kind of move through these different types of um, interaction. So at a certain point, people would question, is this the human here, is this the human as a proxy to the machine? And it led to these really dynamic, incredibly vulnerable conversations mm -hmm. that eventually would get to the technology and talking about the technology, but in a way that wasn't where it would have started, you know, okay. and, the, and the fear. Yeah. So it became this act of, kind of to your point, this act of almost like collaborating with something was changing your perspective of how you were interacting with it or what the potential could be yeah. and how important the stakes were that we needed to have as many voices involved in that process as possible and that it shouldn't be determined by a select few but it should be all of us being able to talk about it and empowering people to realize that they could talk about it because they were interacting with it. Interesting. There's, a, there's a critical consciousness that you're referring to, critical engagement, right, that you aren't just it's not just about being at the same dinner table. It's not just about friendship or liking each other, even seeing each other. There's something about engaging, creating, constructing, being critical, Together. collectively thinking Collecting, about the yeah. problem and, and not simplifying the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just our friendship that's getting in the way that makes stigma problematic. There's there's something else happening there. And getting into more more deep, I think, engagement is, is an, well, an important I remember part of the a process. study that was done many years ago, maybe out of the University of Michigan of uh, looking at different towns in India that had diverse populations, meaning largely Hindu and, uh, and Muslim, which is uh, the major conflicts that, that take place. And they found that the towns in which uh, there was a kind of, what's the word I'm looking for, a, a structure where people work together, whether it was in unions or it was in town councils, uh, that they had many fewer incidents of violent outbreaks against each other. And so the whole idea of working together, uh, having diverse populations working together has, since I've read about that, struck me 
yeah. as uh, and and just wondering whether you can use this technology to get that to happen without having to form a union or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah uh, you give people the experience of working together. But you need people who are not necessarily technologists right. telling stories right. using the technology. Right. So you need people who don't necessarily understand the ins and outs of the technology itself, but are bringing very important, diverse perspectives. Well, if the simulation to works well enough, they'll, well, whatever. <laughs> Just struck me. We have a couple more questions. Uh, how do we address the technology gap between the current modern technologies we're all familiar with? Don't say all. <laughs> iPhones, tablets, etc., and the relatively antiquated technology systems in use among under-resourced social service organizations. I'm not sure I get this. Do you? Mm -hmm. how, how can these organizations effectively introduce and implement modern efforts in their outdated systems? Um, yeah, I think that there, I mean, granted, I'm not in social work, but I think that question is a question that every, that goes across multiple disciplines, yeah. across multiple industries. Yeah. What that is talking about is this tension point of systems that have been built in the, in the previous century right. that are now hitting up against um, the challenges of, uh, you know, an ever-shifting digital landscape. Right. And in certain regards, like, how do you bring new emergent technologies that, because the challenge is, I can see how well this device works that was built for a consumption need, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a phone. Right. And then I look at what I use in my, my workplace and I say, well, this is so intuitive. Why is this so broken? Right. And now I've gotten um, uh, kind of, I've, I've, I've learned how to use these new interfaces and I'm looking back and I'm seeing that these things are outdated, but the challenge is looking and realizing the amount of resources that went into actually developing that device, let alone removing any of the ethical considerations in terms of the addictive qualities of that device, but now thinking about how do we actually make that, um, how, how do we bring the usability into these outdated systems because it's a whole infrastructure question, you know, it's a whole data question, it's a, you know, it's the architecture, it's the design, it's the lack of resources. So that that's a wicked problem, wicked problem. right there, yeah. you know, that is, is being faced by everyone yeah. currently. Yeah, and I think, you know, technologists are not necessarily considering those spaces when they're developing the technology. They've just moved on, but they haven't really thought about the issue of translating that or integrating that into these outdated systems. Um, and to my point that I made earlier, also bringing those people to the table early in the process. If you think you want a tool that's going to be used across industries, bring people from those industries into your development process so that you can understand the ecosystem in which the technology might be used. I would think for many of these places, the issue of cost is enormous. Yeah, resource allocation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about social service organizations. It's one thing to talk about organizations that can raise huge, huge investment funds and change their systems. But, but or universities, of course, they just raise tuition. Yeah. Right? So, so they modernize by raising tuition. That has its own consequences. But let's take this other question. Oh, okay. I'm going to cut you off so we do sure. this question. Could we explore the areas that virtual reality and interactive art could be used in for professional trainings? Law enforcement, child welfare, any profession that engages in diverse environments that require cultural competence. We did a project that helped to form the lab that was called My Sky is Falling, and I had come across a woman who ran a small NGO that uh, worked with kids that were uh, transitioning out of foster care. Mm. And I knew nothing about foster care. Right. I didn't know that the vast majority of states were 18 or, or 21. And so I, I became fascinated by the stories that she told me, and I wondered, what if I brought foster care, you know, like foster youth into my classroom, and what if they interacted with my students, and what if they co-designed something together that would right. help you to understand that emotional journey of a foster youth, right? Yeah. And so they, we built these small prototypes, ended up doing some stuff um, that used one of the main kind of uh, metaphors in that was that they felt like it was a ticking time bomb mm. that they're aging out. And so my students did things with objects, they did things with like a moment where you had to diffuse a bomb, they did, did, did all this interesting work and then we, we ran it for some outside people and, and then some folks from uh, an organization connected to the UN uh, asked us to come and run it at an event for the UN. So uh, I think that the thing that was really fascinating about that was that the level of 
n not only the empathy, it gets back to what we were talking about before, the empathy led to some degree of action, the collaboration led to a, 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 a mutual learning in, or a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment. It wasn't just that the foster youth were there as, you on know, display on display. Shape, yeah. they, they were directly helping to shape what this was. And by shaping it and being there, it was more authentic and more real. And then what that did in conjunction with the students was like off the charts. So yeah. I think you can definitely use that to. Yeah, to, to yeah. we're doing it as well with the VR. We, you know, lots of large private organizations, nonprofits have reached out who want to do deep work around racial equity, who want to use this kind of experience to trigger the types of conversations and, and critical construction that I think needs to happen after you leave the VR. So yes, I think there's, there's lots of opportunities to I'd to love to it. continue this conversation, but I've been told we're out of time. In fact, I think we've run over, over time. time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're done for today, and I want to thank both of you. I'm really impressed by, uh, by the two of you and the work oh, that you're so doing. Good. It's really thank incredible. You. Courtney Cogburn and Lance Weiler. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you uh, Just Society's Live is going to be back on Thursday without me. And there'll be a discussion with a very interesting uh, young man who's a mayor of Stockton, California, uh, Michael Tubbs. And he's been working on creating income, uh, an income base, I believe, for the city of Stockton. Very interesting stuff. And he'll be talking with Professor, Professor Esther Fuchs uh, from the School of International uh, and Public Affairs. She's a former special advisor to Mayor Bloomberg. So they have a lot in common to talk about. Should be interesting. That's Thursday at 10.30 a.m. And then I'll be back next week with another issue of uh, Just Societies Live, and we'll be talking about health and human rights. And hopefully that, too, will be an interesting conversation. Again, thank you okay, for joining thank you. us. Thank, you. thank the audience for joining us. And we hope that you will tune in again Thursday and then again next Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too.